Welcome. Welcome to Covestro Circular Economy Days. My name is Niko Palosuo, and I'll be hosting two talks this week around what's next in circular economy. On Tuesday, we discuss the role of sustainable materials and technologies with Nick Abatella from Dell, Michael Carlos from Nova, and Johan Hart from Covestro. So, if you missed that episode, you can go to YouTube and check it out. But today, we'll dive into the fascinating topic of circular design. Because to make the economy circular, the products have to be designed in a way that they are, first of all, made and then made again. And of course, that's much easier said than done. And that's why we have, again, a super panel of experts to discuss this with. So let's get right into it. Let me welcome live from London. Chris Lefteri. Chris is a leading authority. Hey, Chris. You are a leading authority on materials and their application in design. And you're also an author of several books in the field. And that's why I'm sitting in front of your bookshelf. Chris is representing his own studio, Chris Lefteri Design. So great to have you with us, Chris. You're welcome. My pleasure. Looking forward to some lively discussion. Next up, we have a lady that knows everything there is to know about color and aesthetics. And I'm talking, of course, about Emily Shi. Live from Shanghai, we can see the city lights of Shanghai uh, be, uh, behind her. Emily is working as business development manager for color aesthetics for Covestro Engineering Plastics. Welcome, Emily. So great to see you. And I have to click the unmute button on my side, and then we can actually hear you. Good to see you, ah. Emily. <laughs> Hello again. This is Emily from Shanghai. Nice to meet you. And last but not least, I'm very, very honored to welcome Yvonne Xian, Covestro's guru, sustainability marketing manager, also live from Shanghai. Welcome, Yvonne. Thanks, Nico. Thanks for having me. And of course, you, dear audience, and I talk to you, you can be a part of this conversation by typing in your comments, questions, or protests in the chat box. We are able to see all of them on this side and are very, very happy to get your live feedback and get you a part of this conversation. So let's start um, with you, Chris, to start off uh, the conversation and starting with the obvious. As someone coming from Finland, we witness the circular design of nature very clearly because, you know, nature's products come to life and then they decompose to become life again. And there is hardly any waste in the circle of life. So if you look at it, nature has been kind of doing circular economy for millions of years. And now we have to improve our designs to get rid of waste, especially given the increasing population of the planet where more and more consumers are well, consuming products. So, Chris, how do you look at this through your designer glasses, if I may say so? I, I've always been a designer since a little boy, and I remember looking at um, you know disused items of you know buildings or products, and you know I was really fascinated when those products became reused for something else. Like, I always remember seeing these uh, when i was on holiday in cyprus seeing these architectural steel rods that come out of a building that they leave if they want to extend the building in later years that then they would turn into a, a little holder for a plow pot and i and i love that idea of, of reuse and i think it's something in my nature that i don't like to throw things away i like to reuse things it's as part of being a, i think makes me it makes me the, the designer that i am you know I, i'm very kind of curious to find new ways of looking at, at the world and new things to do with what other people have maybe considered waste and that's obviously you know when we come from when I talk about the world of materials and plastics it's absolutely um, in line with what we're, what we're doing now and I th what I've seen change over the last few years is is an incredibly rapid you know steep curve maybe over the last three years of this discussion and uh, you know, we've evolved even the language that we use. You know, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, sustainability. We talked about, you know, eco. Now we talk about circularity. You know, even, even the words that we use have evolved. And um, 
And obviously circularity is, is one of the key key points for the discussion today. And what I'm really interested in is actually within the design process, how you can change the way that designers think and how, um, you know, rather than starting with the traditional method of designing, which is generally a sketch, um, you can change that mindset and um, start with something else, which is my statement, my provocative statement. And Chris, certainly it sounds like you have, you know, you are born to think of design as a circular process, which I, I, I think is very, it, it's great to hear. Um, and of course, you know, we are all part of nature as well. So from, from that point of view, I guess, uh, mimicking the nature as we, as we design um, objects would be kind of, kind of natural. Yvonne, I mean, I, I know you are passionately driving sustainable development already f for years. So Yvonne, from, from your point of view, how can materials support circular design and, and what does it really mean from a, from a, from a material perspective? Yeah, thanks Nico. Um, I think it goes without saying that uh, materials are an int integral part to circular design because when it comes to designing any physical products, um, it will always involve material selection, right? Actually as a first step. Um, so that's why I think, you know, um, inherently when we talk about circular design, we need to talk about materials. Um, and um, if we look at the current status quo of how we are, you know, how efficiently we are using the materials, it actually presents a quite dismal picture, um, as you can see. Thanks, Nico, for putting up the slide. Um, here I have some numbers I think that could speak far more powerfully than I could possibly do. Right, 90% of the raw materials used in manufacturing in Europe become waste even before the product leaves the factory. 80% of products made in Europe get thrown away within just first six months of their existence. And in the electrical and electronic sector, only 74% of the e-waste generated globally in 2019 was recycled. This is an enormous loss, right? We miss out on the opportunities to make these products and materials um, in circulation. And in order to put an end to this wastefulness, we need to fundamentally reconsider design and the way we approach materials. Um, I think to put it simply, um, I think we can think about, for example, design with increased uh, resource efficiency, uh, meaning you know, um, design out waste at the very beginning, uh, also use as few materials as possible to deliver the functional needs of a product and when it comes to materials in this aspect, um, I mean, we can, you know, s consider selecting materials uh, that is lighter, but, you know, with higher stiffness, um, which means we can reduce, um, you know, the, the, the amount of materials that goes into a product. And when we, took, uh, uh, when we look at the life cycle of a product, right, um, we could also say, okay, let's design for extended product life. Um, let's select materials that are durable um, to make sure um, the materials and the products could stay in use for as long as possible. And finally, when it, co uh, when it comes to end of life, um, design for recycling, uh, it goes without saying. And here, I think um, a best example I can think of is um, at Covestro, we actually have developed a very innovative design concept for automotive headlamp. And in this case, what we do is we try to reduce the material types. Um, because the traditional design of the headlamp, they use a lot of different material types and there are a lot of components. So this presents challenges when it comes to recycling. Um, so what we do is we use um, completely PC materials, polycarbonate materials to design this headlamp. And that means easier end of life recycling, right? We just have one, uh, one material stream, one waste stream, um, you know, that that requires very little effort in terms of um, um, recycling. So um, all in all, I think, you know, uh, materials, again, is a fundamental component uh, when it comes to circular design. And here we are just trying to, you know, call on the designers, um, you know, through, for example, strategies like material recirculation and increasing material efficiency, we could really contribute a lot to a more resource efficient and circular future. Thanks. Um, thanks, Yvonne. And I, I think these examples um, are really helpful to kind of see uh, what we're talking about and also to, to see the aesthetics of, of, of the materials, which brings me to, to, to Emily. Um, and, and Chris already mentioned in the beginning the, 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 the flower pot. 
But Emily, Christo, when, when talks about when we think about aesthetics of sustainability, mm -hmm. which I, I think is, is an interesting pair of words to begin with, aesthetics of sustainability. I mean, if you let that roll over your thumb, that means actually a lot. Emily, how is circular design and aesthetic design connected from your point of view? As you know a lot yes. about these things, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for Nico's question. It's a very good question. And actually, when we talk about the aesthetic design and the circular design, I would like to introduce another one. It is a functional design. Because let us think, at the very beginning, when there is a design, want to design a cup, the purpose is to help the people to drink the water. So at the very beginning, designer help us to create the functional value. And now in the market, we have a lot of the products. Then when the customer want to pick up a new cup, it is not only for the functional, but also he want to pick up a very cool or, or very beautiful or very unique cup. So this value is created by the uh, created by the aesthetic design about the inertial value. And now more and more people and end users, they have the awareness to think whether this cup is made by the recycled material, whether the cup itself, it can contribute to the uh, eco-friendly. So this kind of the awareness, we can say it is a circular level. So this is a different three level. And I still remember in 2000 years, there is a very well-known designer in Japan, and his name is Nagaoka-san, Nagaoka Kene, and he calls for the long life design. It means every designer should design the product can have the long-term using. So uh, actually we can design the product with a durable material, but in another side, we also want to have the design shape or the design surface can persuade the consumer to keep using it. Then how to keep using it? Actually, this is the emotional value. This is created by the aesthetic design. So we can say aesthetic design and the circular design, they are the master for the now for the product design. And the circular design, it is an attitude that we need to design the product for the environment, for the eco-friendly, and how we can uh, persuade our consumer to keep using it is related to the emotional value. So it is aesthetic design. So these two help each other uh, in the market. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. I think these are all really important aspects um, that many of us may actually not even think about considering then when we think about the how do you design in a, in a circular way and how, how is it supposed to look like? Because I think that's also one, one important aspect. Um, what are the expectations from, from, from the consumers? But let's, let's go back to designers and, and the ethos of designers. And let me come back to Chris. Do you, do you think designers are kind of, are, are they lazy when it comes to sourcing new materials like recycled materials or biomaterials? What do you, what do you, what do you uh, think? That's a great question. I think that um, designers probably really hungry to find new materials but i think the problem the block i always find is the organization that stops these um you know materials for you know moving forward and i, I think you can ask many designers about uh whether they have a, a drawer full of samples material samples you know on their desk and i'd say that in a high proportion would say yeah they collect things and they keep them but actually to move those materials through large organizations is 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 really challenging and uh, the um the um the, the, I think the role of design is to help communicate the value of these materials to their organizations and ultimately to what Emily was saying, which was about the emotional, the functional and the, and the circular story. Because as far as I'm concerned, the materials contribute to stories. And you can see this incredible uh, trend, I think growing trend for uh, plastics, which, you know, in some degree show their... Um, show their aesthetics of sustainability because you know we want to be drawn to these products and you you can't always ex expect a marketing uh you know story to explain that you can't always expect expect the packaging to explain that story you want the product to be clearly visible and you want plastics which maybe show that they're made from uh you know waste materials or you know have these swirly marbling effects because that indicates um you know recycled content but i think the most important thing 
is the the designers can build values and stories that turn it into a very turn this kind of choice that consumers have into a very positive emotional choice because yes it's about longevity yes it's about um, you know circularity and recycling of, of products and I think uh, you know the car headlamp that Yvonne was saying is a great example of a mono material product that you can see more and more examples of but you know what what's going to compel a consumer to choose this product which is let's say a standard you know plastic product that uses you know five or six different materials versus this product which is much better for the environment i don't think it's a fee i don't think it's the guilt thing and i don't think it's the cost thing i think it's it's like i really want to own this one because it's the coolest it's the most beautiful and it's and, and it's better for the environment and i think that designers have to build these stories to really get that across so that you know consumers are um are um, you know putting those are, are seeing the value as a, as an attractive thing as a desirable thing and then it's sustainable rather than you know the sustainable thing coming uh, first because I think we're all driven by our emotions you know we buy things because they make us feel better I mean in, in most cases you know unless we're buying a new pair of Wellington boots for, them, going for a walk <laughs> you know we buy things you know, we buy this car over that car because we prefer the way it looks, the way it drives, actually they all do the same thing. But it's that emotional thing that I think that, um, you know, materi materials, you know, uh, and more so plastics can contribute to. And I don't think designers are lazy. I think it's a very good question, but I think that it's more, it is such an uphill struggle to get these materials through organizations and all the different teams that it's really, it, it becomes a team effort in order to make that happen. Thanks, thanks, Chris. And I, I, I think it's great how um, you talk about how a, a recycled plastics can be also, you know, the coolest thing you, you can get. Um, and how the design and the material choices of the product make it so super cool. And being a part of the circular uh, economy, uh, I think it's really, really interesting to follow how these products, recycled products, reused products, uh, pick up in the market. Thank you so much already for, for the great commentary we're getting uh, from, from the net. Let me just book this one up. Thanks you, Azash. Uh, I, I think a good comment. Are we prepared to pay a little bit extra to choose sustainably sourced materials over equally good alternatives, which is cheaper? Um, if yes, do the designers, buyers know and follow the spirit? Uh, I think this is exactly what we also talked about. Um, uh, uh, is there willingness, willingness to, to, to pay for that? So let me come uh, also also back, I think, to that uh, that topic. But before we go there, um, Yvonne, I, I know that there is to help the designers on this way, to help um, the designers to go in the direction that Chris just outlined, there is a magic book that you have come up with. So Yvonne, is there any truth to that? Is there a magic book? And I think I have a picture of the magic book. Yvonne, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks for calling it a magic book. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually a brainchild of our sustainability team. So we actually, and of course, with the support of our partners, we actually partnered a circular, partnered with a circular economy consultancy based out of Taiwan um, to co-author a book, which we call a circular design guidebook, as you can see from the picture here, um, to help designers and developers basically to integrate um, end of life disposal and circularity into the design of, the, of new products. Um, because we basically want to help, you know, um, different industries to shift from a linear to a circular and regenerative model where we think, you know, end of life materials are no longer viewed as a waste, but more as a valued resource. Um, of course, when we started, we started with the electrical and electronics industry, but the concept and the strategies we brought up in this guidebook is actually um, applicable to different industries. And I think uh, what makes this book unique is um, it has provided a much needed framework um, to help designers to consider the life cycle of a product. Um, and even better to think holistically about, you know, how we could um, possibly create meaningful impacts along each stage of the product's life cycle. So, um, you know, it could also, you know, inspire designers to, you know, help them ask very meaningful questions um, from circular material choices to circular business models. You know, questions like, um, can I design a more durable product? Um, can you know, my design help the product uh, to become easier to uh, upgrade, to repair? 
um, you know, so that it can stay in use for as long as possible. And um, you know, when it reaches end of life, um, can the materials be easily separated and then recycled? Um, and last but not least, of course, um, questions like, you know, is there a reverse supply chain in place to help us take back these um, end of rough materials? So um, I think it's a personally, uh, of course, I'm biased, <laughs> but I still I think um, it's a great book that could help designers who are starting, you know, um, to look into um, design for circularity. Um, and of course, um, Covestro as a materials uh, manufacturer, uh, we also tried, you know, to make sure in this guidebook we provide, um, you know, very practical tools and processes um, to help designers select the right materials. Um, to achieve their circularity goals. So yeah, um, if anyone out there is interested, um, feel free to you know leave your messages. We we are actually sharing openly uh, an educational version of this guidebook. Uh, we're happy to share it with um, with the designers across industries. Thank you, um, thank you, Yvonne. And now that we have seen the magic book, um, I'm sure our we will find a way to distribute that uh, within within the audience. Um, let's go a little bit also back to the to the as, as, as aesthetics uh, part and aesthetic design. Um, Chris, you also mentioned in the beginning. I mean, how would you design something that looks to be not only is but also looks to be a part of the circular journey? Um, so, how do you actually reflect those aesthetics of circular design? Um, I, let me come back to Emily, um, our, our, our resident guru in, in, in that field. Um, what does aesthetic design mean mean for Covestro? Do you have any 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 examples? Oh yes, and actually in Covestro we have the team called Global Color and Design (CMF), and we use the CMF. It is a color, material, and a finish to stand for the aesthetic design in Covestro. So if we see what is the color, material, and the finish, and mainly it contributes the value on the emotional value. And actually it is belong to the industry world, one of the work from the industry designer, but actually it is a closed subject. If you want to do the very good job in the CMF, you have to know not only the design, not only the art, you also need to know the engineering and the material how to make it visible. And uh, also you have to know the uh, marketing and the consumer insight to create the design concept that in the future the end user will willing to buy. So CMF it is, uh, sorry. So CMF is uh, our global team and we work for the aesthetic design in Covestro. And actually uh, in the last question, we already mentioned that the aesthetic design CMF can contribute the emotional value for the uh, design. But also CMF is a very good tool for our product uh, marketing and development. If you turn to the next slide, Nico, uh, there is a graph. Hello, Nico. Yes. Yeah, can you see the next slide? We have the graphic to show, yes, why we say CMF is a good tool to contribute to the circular design economy, because not only is it contribute to the emotional value, but also you can see um, we can just use um, middle or strong, we can get the middle or strong marketing impact with uh, less expense. So just to see what, what we have in our, um, sorry, I turned on the light. Just to think about what we have in our real world, there are a lot of the product or brand, they just change the color or change the surface, then they can create the new topic. So this is the CMF value. And if we go to another slide, it is also, if there is a, if the life of the product is going down, we still can create the new CMF to make it the new topic and the new life for this product. So we say CMF is a very good tool to contribute to the economy design as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Emily. Um, also bringing uh, the, the kind of the economic factors of, of, of CMF design um, into play, which I think is also a topic that we have been seeing from the chats also. Thank you very much. And maybe coming back to uh, the point from uh, Ajat uh, Khan and um, his comment, um, let me just put it up here. 
um, are we prepared to pay a little bit extra to choose sustainability? Let me come back to that topic. Uh, and Chris, uh, let me pick your brain on this one, because today, obviously, nature uh, is, is paying the price for unsustainable uh, uh, products. So when we talk about the cost of materials, uh, who will pay the price going forward, in, in, in your opinion? Well, I don't think it should be a choice. I mean, it's like, you know, it's it's like th this road only. It's not a case of, you know, we shouldn't have that choice. It should be a case of, you know, this is what it takes. This is what it takes, right? I mean, if it, if it means that our, our products, our goods, our, you know, apparel becomes more expensive, so be it. But, you know, I, I don't think we have that choice, that luxury of saying, well, you know what, it's a little bit too expensive, I'd rather not. I think it's really just about uh, making it a, a one, uh, one option only. I think one thing that I, I, I just want to reflect on, because I think one thing that we've all been talking about, and, and that maybe I didn't expand on at the beginning when I was talking, was that, um, you know, I think this whole conversation for me is, uh, is about putting materials first. You know, from a design perspective, uh, you know, as I said, you know, we start by sketching. This is a traditional model of designing. We sketch, and then the material selection becomes comes at the end. I think the the, um, the guide that Yvonne was sharing, I think, helps. You know, put materials at the beginning of that process. I think the slides that um, Emily was showing puts you know putting CMF at the beginning of that process. And for me, you know, in the work that we're doing with with the clients that we have, in, in, you know, and design and materials, it's about saying to the materials, what do you want to be material? You know, ask the material what it wants to be and let that define the process. Because, you know, we start with this, we, we have this model of, you know, I design something and then I have to find the material to fit this. Sure, that's okay, but you know, that's loaded with obstacles. And I know it's, it's a very simplistic description that I'm offering or a solution that I'm giving because of organizations don't work in that way. But I think if we can try and get into this habit of, of saying, you know, if you took away all these tools, if you took away all the sketching and the CAD and you just said, you know, you're going to start by designing from, you know, with waste. This is your starting point. Um, then that that in itself gives you opportunities that, um, you know, probably you wouldn't have discovered if you were, you know, drawing something out in a two in two dimensions. So I think the the most important thing is that we put materials at the beginning of that process, and you know, not just about how to use ma materials and plastics in a in a tech for technical solutions. You know, going back to you know how, for example, a polycarbonate can be used in the headlamp to fulfill multiple um, options. It's about you know a guide to designing with waste because you know waste has its problems of designing with. I mean, you you can't, for example, have in in all cases have a huge range of color. So if your color palette is limited, then what does that allow you to do? And, and or if you want to have you know very specific color, how do you achieve that? Or if you want to have a specific effect, how do you achieve that? You know with sustainability in mind. So I think these, it's, it's changed in the way that, um, I think definitely for designers within organizations work. Um, hopefully then, as I said, because for me, designers hold the, hold the key to stories uh, and, then, and then organization changing so that engineering gets on board with that very early on, that sourcing gets on board with that very early on and, and understands that there is a huge impact if you go down this route of, of I'm going to work with this material because it's going to reduce our you know CO2. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, and and let's let, let's 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 talk about um, materials and and their perceived value. Uh, let me just show you. I think a great comment from um, from Jonas. Uh, the better Covestro can communicate the advantages of material to designers, the better they can advocate its conversation with their clients. Thank you very much, uh, Jonas, for, for for that comment. So let's talk a little bit about perceived quality. Um, let me go uh, back to you, Yvonne, um, because there is a maybe a perceived compromise of quality and performance when you are using recycled materials. So kind of the opposite of where you want to go. So Yvonne, how do we, how do we balance between sustainability and, and performance from, from your point of view? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nico. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, indeed, there's a, a general perception, as you said, um, of inferior quality associated with uh, recycled materials. Um, but actually, um, not being, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, too technical. Um, but I think that's not necessarily true. Um, 
depending on where we are sourcing the feedstock from um, and you know if we can source very high quality recyclates uh, we can actually achieve um, you know comparable performance um, of recycled materials with that of virgin material but i get it um, in many cases uh, there are indeed a lot of challenges uh, when it comes to designing with recycled materials um, but i think there are actually a lot of ways to mitigate the risks um, uh, you know, uh, going back to what Chris just mentioned, I really like her point, uh, his point that, you know, we can't just complete the design and then we go about selecting the materials because the design is done based on your knowledge about the existing materials, right? Um, but recycled materials is a complete different um, material type. So um, one example I, I can think of is, let's say, you know, if we want to use recycled plastics um, as the outer shell of a product, let's say, Maybe you know we could consider and going back to Emily's um, point about aesthetics, CMF design, etc. Maybe we could we could consider um, designing textured surfaces instead of these you know large high gloss surfaces um, because textured surfaces could protect the materials from being um, scratched um, and make the product more durable, right? Um, so I know this may might be an oversimplified example, um, but the point is um, recycled materials versus virgin materials. And they have very different um, properties. Um, and that means during the design phase, again, we need to put materials first to Chris' point. Um, it's the same logic, you know, if we are thinking about switching from, let's say, metal to composite materials, um, it's not just, you know, when the design is complete, we just uh, switch to the, a different material. Um, so, yeah, I think um, to summarize, I think, yes, there might be challenges when it comes to recycled materials, but um, the most important thing is we start from material and start from the features of that material uh, to have our design ideas. Um, and um, the last point I want to make on this topic is, I know we today we talk a lot about recycled materials, but let us not forget, um, there is actually a quite large portfolio out there, um, you know, you know, like materials made with renewable content um, that are not necessarily, um, you know, with inferior quality uh, compared to virgin materials. Um, so, for example, our macro RE uh, polycarbonate materials from Covestro, they actually have the exact same properties as the virgin materials. So it's a dropping solution. So designers don't have any limit when it comes to um, colorability, you know, um, any other, you know, mechanical performance, etc. So, um, yeah, again, a lot of opportunities out there um, if we are willing just to, you know, explore and get to be, get a better understanding on these materials. So I think it's very, it's, it's great. I mean, we have to be optimistic about, about the possibilities of, of recycled uh, materials. But let me uh, get back to you, Chris. I mean, based on your experience, what is, what is your experience to consumers' reaction to second life materials? I mean, as you have good experience on, on, on this topic, are, are the consumers kind of, rather reacting more negatively towards that uh, than still than uh, um, rather I, being part of the solution i mean i i don't have i don't i wish i had some tangible data that said you know consumers you know 90 percent of consumers really value products but i don't and i don't have that i can only go by what i sense and what i see just in you know in, in my own world and i mean you know you can see this huge growth in um, I mean I think it, it started with um, uh, maybe the, the timber industry and sustainably you know sourced timber and FSC timber then it became about um, um, uh, food and organic food and you can see that in the number of uh, stores that have opened up or supermarkets that have you know focus on you know have just eco organic sections um, in terms of products um, I mean, I think the, the huge um, uh, number of sales of uh, electric vehicles, I think from, from where I am in London, I can see a huge uh, increase in the number of electric vehicles that are on the road and new, new uh, brands bringing electric vehicles to market. I think that um, in a sense, that it's, it's not just the consumers, that it is up to it is up to the, the brands, the um, you know, who are, who are bringing as us as consumers these products to, you know, have have a more responsible attitude to, uh, 
you know, packaging of these products, the distribution of those products, the, you know, the collection of those products and the end of life and the disassembly of those products so that they can, you know, put back into the, to the stream. And I, so I don't think it's necessarily just consumers. I mean, I think consumers need a lot of help. I think that we're not like the biggest, um, um, I don't think we're responsible enough. I think it's up to you know, organizations, government, legislation to enforce certain things. I mean, just on a side note, you know, I live in a place where every week I feel like I can see somebody's cutting a tree. It really upsets me that people cut trees down. So it's like, you know, for me, it's like make a law that stops people from cutting trees. It's a simple thing. It may not be to everyone's you know, liking, but you know, hey, we've been spending the last 18 months walking around with a mask and locked down. You know, if we had to do it, you know, somebody has to enforce it. So, yes, I think consumers obviously have a huge role to play because they drive the, the, the manufacturers. But I do think the manufacturers um, have a huge uh, role to play. And the manufacturers that I, I've been working with can see that. They absolutely appreciate that they have to change, partly because they feel guilty and they have a sense of responsibility, but also because they see that legislation is coming that they have to prepare for, that if they don't prepare for, is, is going to really impact on their business. So. Yeah, so we are we are in, in, in we are just at the at the brink of a massive kind of uh, aesthetic change of of circular products. Um, and I, I've seen some examples. I think also from Chris, I've seen some uh, examples where you know the aesthetics of these designs just look different from what we're used to. Looking at, at sure. a high high quality uh, product, I mean, uh, you, you have any, any examples you, you want to share, uh, Chris, on this regard? You have you have some images of swirly plastics. I think this is an example. I think of I, I do. Let me let me show you one thing, to. which I think is is, is something that, that really you know, look at look at this one. I mean, this what does this tell you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, whether this sample is using um, recycled content or not, I don't know. But this is an effect, this is a trend. I think it's becoming much more, uh, it's, it's becoming bigger. Because, you know, you can see it's, it's not perfect. It, not, not each piece is going to be the same. Because those two colors, those three or four colors, you know, being blended together, talk about different materials coming together, you know, waste materials with virgin materials. And that, in its sense, it becomes fun, it becomes trendy. And there are some amazing, um, uh, you know, running shoes that are really far ahead in the, of, of that curve. I mean, partly because they're in a, in a fast-moving, uh, you know, apparel industry. But um, but I think this is something that's been around maybe for five years, but is growing. This this particular theme of recycled content becoming very visible. And I know you have some other slides from I think it was Emily uh, of, uh, shoes. Yes, let me bring up, which I think is uh, also a fascinating example of different looking products. Let's uh, put it up. So, uh, you know, just your reaction. I mean, what is, and also to your, you know, to the audience, what, what is your first impression when you see a product like this? Just purely based on aesthetics. Please write your commentary on the box right now so we can show it. But before, you know, so, so, uh, but uh, you know, Emily uh, and Yvonne, maybe you can also comment on this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Yvonne, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Yeah, I think uh, Chris already mentioned a lot, right? Uh, I think, um, you know, these brands, especially leading brands, um, they are setting very um, ambitious targets, first of all, um, you know, their uh, road to circularity or climate neutrality. That's why they have a strong motivation um, to adopt these uh, either recycled or, you know, more sustainable materials. And the, the trend we are witnessing, you know, because at Covestro we serve a lot of downstream industries, um, the trend we are witnessing is, you know, there's an increasing interest in developing these uh, unique uh, visual effects um, that speaks to the uh, sustainability attributes of the materials. Um, this shoes from Nike, um, I think it's obvious, right? Nike is sending an unequivocal message that this is made from trash, this is made from waste. And they are celebrating the waste materials um, as an inspiration for creativity. Um, so, um, yeah, I think um, part of that is driven by, you know, these um, corporate 
uh, level goals and targets. But part of the other part of it is also, you know, I think there's an increasing pressure on the brand side to differentiate, right? Um, you know, many brands are now starting to use recycled materials. Um, but I, I remember seeing a comment um, from the audience saying, nowadays, you know, the products made from recycled materials, they all look you know, the same as other virgin you know, uh, materials because brands are trying to hide, um, you know, the, uh, the impurities or the contamination coming from these recycled materials. But now we are seeing um, this change, right? Uh, we are making these, um, the so-called imperatives actually more visible and to celebrate them. So I think it's, uh, I'm very happy to, this, to see this trend. And I think this trend is going to um, pick up very quickly. Um, so yeah, um, very excited to, 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 to see this. I think there was a comment that just came out from Alessandro about quality control. I think one of the very interesting things about this this particular shoe is that if you look quite close, if you're not, not too closely, I mean, it's quite obvious, but you could even see it in this image here that the particles that are in that midsole, you can almost unpick them. I mean, it's not like a, it's not like it's a smooth surface. It's a very rough, very raw surface. But that that sense of imperfection that actually, you know, when we don't have to have um, everything to finish to an incredibly high degree, I think becomes, you know, and you need these kind of super brands to lead that that idea, but that idea of, of uh, manufacturing defaults or allowing or not being afraid to show different materials not becoming homogenized in a very sleek, uniform surface, I think is also really important. I, I think fascinating aspect, and thank you so much for our audience for giving your insight. We're getting real live feedback from our uh, audience. Uh, let me, uh, Emily, again, as someone who has been looking at the aesthetics of, of recycled materials uh, for a while, we know um, in parallel, uh, already for years, recycled papers have looked differently mm -hmm. than virgin ones for, for, for quite a while, either as being textured or, or I think yellow in some countries. So do we have this kind of design signal for sustainability uh, in industry design from your point um, as well, Emily? And how do we make sustainable be visible by, by aesthetic design? Yes, actually it is a very good question. And uh, back to the shoes from the um, marble, actually in the recent two years, we also received a lot of the requests from our customer to make some marble color. And uh, now from this year, we set up the collaboration with China Tinghua University to research and design what kind of the color and the effect we can stand for the sustainability. It's very easily to be recognized, oh, it is a recycled material. And we think this kind of the request will be more and more uh, from our customer side. Just to think about in the mobility industry, we have the blue to stand for it is an EV car. And uh, also in some color culture, we say the orange can be show the energy and the green, it shows the sustainability. But actually till now, we don't have some standard color to, to say and to let the end user to feel like, oh, this is a recycled, oh, this is eco-friendly. So that's why we set up the, this kind of the research with uh, Tsinghua University. And we think this kind of the um, research also related to the region, related to the color cultural, and uh, then uh, you will see now the in the screen there is a five color, and this five color is uh, episode one from our research. The theme we call the song from the earth. So you will see there are five color from the different element of our world. For example, the color for the wood and the color from the sand the color from the grass. So it's very, very uh, similar to us and uh, let us feel very quiet and uh, uh, clean. So this is the first episode. We also will have episode two, three and four and we will release the episode by episode in next year. Great. So it's, uh, we, we, we can see certainly, uh, you know, the next fashion colors for aesthetic design. I, it's, I think it's fascinating to see how color affects the perceived role for, for sustainability and how that really is, is, seems to be changing uh, of what we used to think of a high quality, uh, high quality and, and desirable uh, product. 
Thanks, Emily. Um, maybe, Yvonne, back to you. Um, what are your observations uh, and feedback from the customers when it comes to developing these tailored uh, designed for, for, um, for recycled materials? Yeah, I think I already uh, kind of uh, mentioned that. Um, but the, uh, we think there's increasing interest for sure. Um, you know, just now I mentioned, um, you know, the, uh, the part of the drivers coming from um, the company level targets, right? And also part of um, it coming from the pressure to differentiate. And then we also see, you know, some push from the consumer side uh, because consumers, especially, uh, well, not, not really so yet in Asia Pacific perhaps, but at least in the US, in Europe, we see a big consumer push. Um, for you know brands to taking action to use more recycled and more sustainable material, right? Um, so yeah, that's why we believe um, you know CMF. Um, that's why uh, I find it that my work and Emily's work is really you know uh, we are coming together, <laughs> circular you know circular design and aesthetic design. Uh, we are seeing this um, synergy in between because brands are coming to us. On the one hand, they have you know they want to use recycled or other more sustainable materials. On the other hand, they also want to differentiate by leveraging the, uh, the, the, the power of CMF or aesthetic design. Um, and that's why we believe you know, CMF should be integral part of circular design. Um, and um, also, you know, we believe we should um, really stay true to the characteristics of recycled materials by giving them a very authentic look and feel. So. And yeah, thank you. I think we're 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 getting a good commentary also from from um, from our stream. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions to our expert panelists, be sure to type them uh, in in the box below. So we still have a couple of minutes time to get their uh, perspectives on this. Uh, Emily, I, let me still come back to you because um, yeah. from from uh, from design perspective, uh, there's another I, I think interesting mm -hmm. kind of way of looking at finishes, looking at colors, reflections. Uh, again, as someone who really knows this topic, can you guide us a little bit about what we're seeing here? Yes, uh, here you see we call the aesthetic truth, uh, which we uh, designed with Chris Latter team together. And this one, these two keys, we stand for our trend color, because from the last year, we published our trend color in automotive industry and electronic industry. So you will see um, this these two keys actually have the two parts. One is a big one we call the bass, and the small one we call the insert. So they can compare together to see the different color uh, combination. Also, we can use the two keys to fully um, see the design capability and the design freedom in our polycarbonate material. You will have the different hue, different chroma, and also you can have the different glows, different transparency. And with the model together, you have the different texture because you, while you run it, you will see the diamond texture and something like the golf uh, texture. Yes, and this is designed by Chris Lattery's team and the color also from our team. Chris, you want to also comment on, on how the, the background of this? I think it was something that one of the, um, the audience uh, brought up earlier, which was you know, educating designers and um, you know, companies like Corvestro being able to um, you know, give guidelines with polycarbonate in, in, well, in this case, polycarbonate, how on how to design with it better. And that's really what this is about. It's about talking um, to designers through their language. And, you know, typically uh, material, material samples, you know, plastic samples um, from chemical companies tend not to have this uh, engaging story to it. And, and, um, and the, the purpose of this, this aesthetic kit, which, uh, you know, was for customers, was to you know, celebrate certain properties of, of uh, transparency, of toughness, of polycarbonate, of textures, um, and colors. So, yeah. Cool, thank you, thank you so much. Um, if any of the audience has any, any questions, feel free to use this opportunity uh, to type them in so we can get, but before we, we wrap up, maybe just, uh, I wanna hear every one of you, you know, what are your greetings to the designers out there who are you know, aiming to design products that will not only be great products and the consumers would love them, but would also really reflect the goals 
uh, of, of the uh, climate movement that we're seeing left and right. I mean, this Sunday, so, you know, just in a couple of days, north from you, Chris, uh, the world is convening in Scotland to talk about what needs to be done to uh, mitigate the effects uh, of global warming. And I think the role of the industry, we discussed that on, on last Thursday, um, is, is big. I mean, the, the industry needs to be able to produce products which are climate friendly uh, and, and even made out of waste uh, in the end uh, fully. So maybe before we wrap up, what are your greetings to those young designers out there who want to be a part of the solution and who want to bring out their great circular designs to the companies um, out there who make these consumer products? Maybe we start, um, Emily, with you. What are your greetings to the young designers out there? What would you say to them as they want to become the greatest circular designers ever? Uh, I would like to say, if you meet with some problem, you can come to us and we can solve the problem with you together. We can provide the research and the design. Also, we have uh, some same training, we can help you. Um, and uh, then uh, you can also follow us, our CMF. You will receive the episode from our uh, study on the sustainability CMF. And I think it also help you, not only for the result, but also you will see how we do it, the methodology behind it. And from it, you can also learn something, I think. <laughs> Great, Emily. Thank you so much. And we already got a, a hint from, from our knowledgeable audience that you will be in uh, at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, January 5th. So if anybody who wants to continue discussions with Emily, um, she will be in Las Vegas at that point. Over to you, Yvonne. What is your message to the young designers who want to make the world uh, circular and design the world circular? Right. Um, so, of course, I'm not designer, um, um, but if I am to, you know, in any position to give any advice to the aspiring young designers out there, I would say, um, you know, probably we need to master the skills of design from recycling and design for recycling, right? Um, start with designing uh, with recycled material and also in the design, consider end of life um, disposal and assembly. Uh, make sure the products you design can be recycled and stay in the loop. Um, if I have to put a time frame on, you know, when you need to master these skills, uh, I would make a bet. I would say by 2025. Thanks, Thanks Nico. Thanks, thanks, Emily. And just you know, to to put a put a um, put a reference to what you just said about time. This is the world carbon club um, with the amount of carbon that we can emit um, to remain in the 1.5 centigrade uh, global warming. So we have seven years, eight months, and 24 days, and a couple of hours to kind of. Um, ensure that it's not above the emissions already um, being emitted uh, by the countries. Let me get that clock back. It's not a doomsday clock, but it certainly uh, reflects the, the necessity and the urgency of action that needs to be done. Um, and Chris, as you are closest to Scotland, you get the last word. What are, your, what are your greetings to the young designers out there who want to make a dent, a positive dent for circular design? Um, put the materials first, put waste first and see where it takes you. Ask the material, ask the waste what it wants to be and let, uh, and, and be the champion within your organization to uh, empower, you know, the, the, to have the products tell that story to consumers uh, and, you know, be the, be, the, be the storytellers within your organization. Thank you so much, Chris. By storytellers, I mean storytellers about why these products are amazing for the environment. That's I, clear on what I meant. Thank you, Chris. I, I think these are very, very, very encouraging words. Um, and I think uh, the movement of get, making decisions, making actions to really mitigate the issues we see through the global warming, I think that's everybody's job. It's the designer's job. It's the communicator's job. Uh, it's the marketer's job. So this is, I think, definitely a, a joint responsibility for all of us as inhabitants of the planet. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you so much, uh, Yvonne and Chris, for taking your time out of London, out of Shanghai, to chat with us about circular design in the context of circular economy and the circular economy days. Thank you so much for our audience, for bringing in your knowledgeable and great comments on the topic. And hope to see you again soon in the next digital event. Thank you very much for participating.
Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.